<laughs> what's going on people we are tottenham tv back here for yet another panel show and we've got returning guest hg how you doing my friend i'm doing well thanks for having me on again it's uh it's good to be top of the league for a change yeah it really is and uh look we'll get into the nitty-gritty of that in a bit but barnaby long time no see um you probably would have recognized barnaby from one of the spurs original channels on youtube spurred on more recently he's been emptying his bank account to penalty takers but how are you barnaby i'm very well i don't want to be a technical annoyance but you guys are very echoey are oh. we can you hear yeah. the echo as well hg yeah i do I hear you I four hear times uh can you put in the chat can the chat hear the echo one sec no they wouldn't be able to but i'm not really sure how to rectify that to be honest is it doable or um one sec would is it because barnaby is it doable or um or do we have to rectify it uh, I mean, I can, I can hear you. HG, are you hearing the same thing? Yeah, yeah, I get the same as you. It, it, it's like you're underwater, but I can hear you at least, you know, it's... Yeah, I can handle it. It's all right. Okay. Um, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll start, we'll start the show and then we'll, uh, we'll try rect... Sammy in the back end, we'll try rectify it as we're live. Um, but Barnaby, you, um, you still got a, a bit of money left in that bank account after all those penalties? Uh, not really, guys. Not really. Um, I'm, I've still got the odd ones uh, left to release. So basically, for anyone who most people won't have seen, I, I did a show called Football Penalty Gamble and um, would challenge people to score five penalties against me because I used to be a goalkeeper. And then I'd give them money if they did. And I think Ben did actually one of the very few people to actually do it with five great pens. But I've actually kind of pivoted a little bit since I'm still doing a bit of that. I've still actually got to release one with former international, uh, England international keeper David James, which I did a couple wow. of episodes with. But uh, I've now kind of brought back the Spurred On brand from, like you said, the original, one of the original Spurs fan channels. I brought it back. It's a podcast. I'm releasing daily podcasts. Uh, it, wherever you guys find your podcasts, which is, you know, be it Apple, Spotify or Google and on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash at Barnaby Slater underscore. So if you want some spurred on daily content you come there and hoping to do some lovely more collabs with you guys as well yeah looking forward to it it's actually quite funny barnaby because i got a, um, a memory on facebook today four years ago today is when we did that podcast um in the studio in acton i think it, it was at acton yeah somewhere around there so to the day so it's good to have you back well if you guys were gonna go back through that podcast that was the day i said so what will have been november of 20 mm -hmm. whatever it was i said in that studio that i fancied us to go very deep in the champions league and that was i believe the mm. year we got to the final Correct. Right. I do we'll remember that. Yeah. Well, true. Let, let's see what the Oracle is saying today. <laughs> let's get, <laughs> and let's get into it. And we're going to start talking about our left wing situation going in uh, to the weekend. Obviously, Chelsea Monday night. HG, do you do you think it's time for Brennan Johnson to give, be given a go now? Yes. I mean, we talk. We hear about Ange talking about how the uh, the attacking hasn't really got there yet. I think that would help us to get better when we're attacking. So we certainly need to have something different. Both the goals came down the wings in the second half on Friday. It, it just feels as if it, you know teams are going to try and keep it narrow against us. And so we need to use the wings better. And that means a bit more pace and a bit more width. Richarlison, as much as he tries, just isn't doing it. Mm. Barnaby, do you feel the same? Is it time to, to drop Richarlison to the bench, bring Brendan Johnson in? Um, so it's an interesting one. Uh, I did a, a match review this week and I said I didn't think it would be long before Brennan Johnson was starting. I'm basing that on the fact that he brought him straight in for the Arsenal game, didn't he? Yeah. Um, and then he got injured in that game. What I would say is, and this is specifically with Chelsea coming up, I do feel like Richarlison is the kind of guy you want to play against Chelsea. It's a big game, home game. Big, I think it's going to be one of the biggest games. I'm going to I'm going to go all out. I think it's going to be one of the biggest games in our history because I think Poch coming back and us wanting to kind of show him what that he shouldn't have gone to Chelsea is going to make the, the crowd so uh, atmospheric and so big. And I'm just wondering whether Big Ange might look at it and say, who do we want on the pitch in that day that maybe will wind up wind up the Chelsea players but also thrive off a crowd like that? He's Brazil's number nine. And I also think... So by which I mean he has experience of this kind of stuff. But what I also think is that he has done much better on the left than he did at, at number nine for us. And it shouldn't be forgotten, forgotten some of those assists that he made. The, the outside of the boot across uh, to Sonny for Liverpool in the Liverpool game, sorry. 
And I just have a feeling maybe he'll stay definitely for the Chelsea game. But not long after that, it wouldn't surprise me if Brennan Johnson is brought in to start. Unless, of course, Richarlison scores or, or does something brilliant in that game. Yeah, it's a, it is an interesting one because I do think Richarlison has been improving. But I don't think he's improved enough to warrant his uh, a start against Chelsea, to be honest. And I think Brennan Johnson, for me, has has shown a lot more in the small spaces of time he's been on the pitch than Richarlison has probably in his whole Spurs career so far. What, what's your thoughts? Um, I wouldn't go that far, but I would say that Brendan Johnson has definitely been bright in his little in his in his performances. He had a very good cameo against Palace with a really nice assist, and obviously against Arsenal missed a couple of chances, but again was involved, was very bright. I agree with Barnaby when, when it comes to Richarlison showing improvement, but then again it was a very low bar at the beginning of the season. Let's be honest; in the first few games, he was absolutely terrible, and I was one. I was I'm one of Richarlison's biggest advocates. I would say in terms of I was a massive fan of the signing I, I really what I was really excited about him coming to Spurs and I've been always one to kind of um when people have been criticizing him backing him up but it has got to the stage where even when he's playing well he's still giving the ball away way too much and he's still still very frustrating and the quality does seem to be lacking albeit he is in the recent weeks he's been contributing a bit more obviously there's Sheffield United golden assist um, as Barnaby said got an assist against Fulham assist against Liverpool so he's definitely upped his contribution a bit but still in game I think he's uh, there was that one moment against Fulham where we're 2-0 up you know an easy ball gets played out to him out wide and he does his stupid control with his back and he gives it away and sets Fulham up on a counter attack and, and Impostor Coglu uh, looked very frustrated at that and, and he does, he's been doing these kind of things um, throughout his Spurs career but I would say this season a few times he's I think he's needlessly given the ball away so there's one thing giving the ball away by like trying to create an opportunity or trying to you know sometimes Madison will look for a defense playing pass or go for a shot and he'll give the ball away I don't mind that too much but it seems like Richarlison a lot of the time is needlessly giving the ball away we're not even attempting things just because of his lack of quality lack of ability to control a football lack of ability to pull off a simple pass that has been very frustrating for me so far um, in yeah, his whole spot I, career. I, I think yeah. that's, I'm not disagreeing. I'm not going to disagree with you. Um, but what I would say is I think a lot of people's opinions on stuff like that is based on the fact that he's not scoring goals as well. So he's lost his confidence. He's not scoring goals. And therefore, so for instance, the example I would use is that I'm pretty sure it was the Fulham Monday game. Yeah. Uh, that ball came across from the right and he hit it first time and it was just a whisker past the post. And I think he did everything technically correct there. And I think that was a classic what I'd call a classic Richarlison finish in that I've got friends and family who are Everton fans and they say he works best off the left and he loves that finish into the far corner side foot. If that goes the other side of the post, I don't think anybody's talking about the fact that he loses the ball every so often because even when Sonny was playing out wide left for us, Sonny, unless it's instinctive and, it's, and a ball's being fizzed at him, his touch can sometimes let him go and his back to, back to goal play is quite average, I'd say. Mm -hmm. but the fact that usually he's scoring lots of goals for us means we don't talk about that and we're not talking about any of that this season but last season we really were so I do think and the fact we played 60 million means that he should be scoring goals the moment he starts scoring goals I think we will stop talking about that and we'll all be totally behind him so it's about a confidence thing and, and I guess how long Big Ange will give him to get that confidence back I, no, I completely agree with that. But that that's the problem. He's got one or what, two Premier League goals since he's come to Spurs. And he is one of these players when he's not scoring, he's a bit of a liability on the ball. That's the pro that is a big problem. See, I don't I don't have the same criticism for Kulisevsky, even though again, I think Richarlison might have more goal contributions than um Kulisevsky this season, but I don't have the same criticism because I see Kulisevsky doing the simple things correctly and doing a very good job for the team. He's not losing the ball needlessly like Richarlison is. He isn't failing to easily control a ball when in, in an easy situation. He's not just giving the ball away willy nilly. He's uh, he's he's got great ball retention. He's quite good at driving the ball forward, and he and he does a very good job of the team. I think Richarlison is a hard worker. Don't get me wrong. I think he does do a good job off the ball. But there's just a frustrating lack of quality that he's been showing. And yes, if he is, this, but I I was asked this question before the Palace game. Would I drop Richarlison? I said no because he because of the reason you just gave. He's contributing. I think he had four goal contributions in the last six games. And as long as he's contributing, I'm happy for him to be in the team. But when he puts in performances, maybe like against Palace, where that contribution is diminishing, and then all of a sudden, what are you left with? You're left with a guy giving the ball away constantly. And I think Brennan Johnson maybe deserves a go, I think, on, on Monday night. 
I think, I mean, to be fair to Richarlison, like none of us really think that left wing in Angie's system is his best position, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I don't think that either, which is why Richarlison started at centre forward in the first game of the season. It, it feels as if for, for the last few games, he's been the best available. Like, I'm pretty mm. certain that Perez yeah. would have started had he been fit. And so now Johnson is probably close Solomon to being as well. Fit and it's, yeah, there you go, right? So it, 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 it's tough to blame Richarlison. I don't really blame him. But it felt like, especially Friday night at Palace, we didn't have Udogi either down the left-hand side. And so I think Palace were quite happy to allow the ball to go to him. They weren't worried about Richarlison's first-time balls around the corner because there wasn't really anyone making those runs anymore. It, it just feels as if, if Spurs really want to be the best they can be with the players that they have, then I think that Johnson or someone should be playing left wing ahead of Richarlison. But, I mean, as Barnaby said, it's Chelsea at home. Rhys James is going to start. He's probably their best right back. Certainly, they're well, one of their best players. So I, I would be a bit nervous about Rhys James down the right hand side, and maybe Richarlison is better um, equipped to, to deal with whatever threat he brings. But yeah. I just, if, if I'm thinking about Spurs and the, and what we can, you know, make, maximizing the potential of our players, then I don't think Richarlison at left wing should ever really happen if others are fit. Mm. It, and it, I it like... just seems a, a fudge. I like the dynamic of Richarlison coming off the bench. I mean, we saw what value it can have in the Sheffield United game. Obviously, came on, got a goal and an assist uh, to win us the game in the dying minutes. But with the kind of praise maybe that Richarlison's getting in recent weeks, maybe not in the Crystal Palace game, but definitely post the last international break where his, his performances have been getting better. Do you think, HG, that he's been held to maybe a different standard than maybe other players in the squad because of how poor he actually was last season? Um, I mean, a different standard. I think Spurs fans just want to see players playing well. Mm. Um, they might have reasons as to why it is or isn't working, but I think if, if Spurs fans see that someone isn't contributing or isn't really doing what they think they could, or that they're, they're, they're going to want to see a change, I don't think there's different standards being applied. No. Can Do you I, think that? I think. Yeah. I think there's a. I think there's a slightly different standard, but being he's being held account to because of the sixty million pounds. Mm. That that's that's what the standard is that people expect from him. I think. You know, in terms of saying he's not contributing, I would disagree on the basis that he's working so hard up and down, as does Deke Kulisevsky. That is the minimum requirement, of course. But the, bear in mind, when, you know, we've also still got another player on our books who costs £60 million who literally won't do that. And that's why he's sent on loan every year, and that's Tango and Abele. So look, Apparently he's know, coming back. He, uh, <laughs> don't I did even. See something today, I don't know. But anyway, like, you know, so he's doing the minimum requirement. He's just out of confidence. And unfortunately, that's not, you know, that's not helping him at the moment. Of course not. But actually, it's interesting you said that about him not, not being the right person on the left. Like I said, my my friends and family who are Everton fans have been saying to me throughout, he's not a natural nine. He works best off the left, and that's where he does his best goal scoring and finishing. Now, what I would agree with does that mean he's the right player on the left as a left forward in the Ange system where he wants people to get in behind? Probably not. And Brennan Johnson would offer us more there. But going back to what you said, HG, about Reese James, I, I wonder if the physicality of Richarlison might be something that Ange looks at uh, against Chelsea. But then also, just to contradict that and forever play devil's advocate, like Ange wants to be thinking about going forward all the time and what we can do going forward. So in that instance, if he's thinking like that, then maybe he will go with Brennan Johnson. And also, yeah, I'm not even it's sure Reese James is going to play though. Like Poch said, he's going to play tonight in the cup. And after such a long injury or or a injury, is he really going to play two games in the space of the week? I, I question that. But it's honest. also important to note that Brennan's first start came in the North London derby. So it's like clearly Ange trusts him in a big game, mm. you know, to do that kind of role. And he did obviously a very good role. So I don't think and I don't think Ange is going to be looking at it thinking, do I trust Brennan? I think he's going to be thinking about it. Who do I think is going to, is best fit for that game necessarily? Not rather like, who do I trust to deal with Chelsea kind of things? Yeah. I clearly, if he's going to put him in against Arsenal, he'll put him in against anyone. Yeah. What I'm saying. Uh, look, to be Maybe honest, I, th I think there'll yeah. be space for us. So I think Brennan Johnson has that raw pace that can attack that space that maybe they'll leave with their attacking system. Sorry, Barnaby. The good, well, uh, th what I was going to say is just that maybe he thought that Brennan Johnson getting at Ben White was uh, mm. a good opportunity. But then I would also say, like, the excitement level now is so high that actually I'm excited because I know whatever decision Ange makes, it'll be the right one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, That's what know, it all comes down to. We can end that the episode here, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> whatever Ange says is the right decision. But I think um, for us, I think both of us are both in agreement that Brennan Johnson should play. Um, HG, you, you're the same, aren't you? Um, 
the fact that it's Chelsea, it does does worry me a little bit because even though they're bad at home, the away record isn't that bad really Chelsea this season. So it, it's, it's all about you know, what are we worried about? Are we worried about them or are we worried about being the best we can be? I think if we're worried about us, then Johnson should probably start because I do think we're better when we when we play with more width and we play with people who are comfortable to be out there. Richarlison mm. in that system just doesn't seem to really know what he wants to do or what he's being asked to do. And that, that that's a problem. We saw that all of last season with Conte's tactics. If the players, it doesn't matter how good they are, if they don't feel comfortable doing it, they're going to struggle. And so it feels as if, considering the way that we want to play, having Richarlison come off the bench or be the central striker is his is his best role. Um, but yeah, it's like, what, what do I think is going to happen? I think Richarlison will start. I don't wow. think Ange is going to switch it. But whether I whether I want it to happen, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of like Barnaby. I, I don't really mind regardless, but I think that uh, yeah, I certainly want Udogi over Davies or someone else. <laughs> left back. I think that one so goes without like, saying, AG. Hey, I think that one that, goes that, without that, saying. But that would help the rest of the team. I mean, yeah, that's 100%. the thing, right? Like, if, if it is Davies, I mean, I, I watched. I was at Palace on Friday night and. I didn't think Davies did badly in the first half. He was he was making the right runs, but people weren't finding him. And so it's not to say that he can't do what a doggy does, but it's just, I do think that affects Richarlison ahead of them. I really do. Mm. Can, Barnaby, I, can, you, I say, yeah, yeah. can I just say, I think, um, and I don't know whether Ange will think like this, but he probably will because he's a legend. But, you know, <laughs> I think there's a chance that Rich, Richarlison could shit house their way to get someone sent off for Chelsea with the big with the with the atmosphere on on Monday night. I mean, equally, there's a possibility he could get himself sent off. But I think there's more chance that he will wind them up enough. He knows those big games, and I wonder if Angel think like that. But similar to HG, like either thing could happen, and I don't mind. Mm, fair enough. All right, let's move on to the next topic, and we're going to talk about um, obviously Spurs for the remaining uh, part of the season. And when you cast your mind back to last season, when Arsenal had a barnstorming start to the season in their first ten games, they lost the game, they drew a game, they won the rest. So Spurs actually have more points now at this stage of the season than Arsenal did last year. And Barnaby, do you think that this Spurs form is sustainable? Good question. I, I think it's sustainable. Um, well, I think it's sustainable to a point. I think I heard this week that if we carried on at this form, we'd have, end up with 98 and a half points or something. I don't think we're going to end up with 98 and a half points. What I do think is we'll that... We'll end up with 98. It's that half point that's going to be yeah, difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's never going to happen. Uh, and it'll be Richarlison's fault. No, um, I, think, um, I think the form in, is sustainable in that I think we can approach this run of more difficult games and potentially not lose a game uh, maybe up until man city away and maybe even including man city away equally i do think it's possible just because of the nature of the premier league that you know we might lose away at wolves for instance right so yeah. i the thing that'll be interesting the first time we do lose is how we bounce back but i just i honestly i just see the the way that the team are celebrating every tackle, the way that they are clearly all together, it's such a throwback to that that start of the 2015-2016 season or, or the whole season under Poch when things just came together at the right time. And the fact that this season, I know it's much talked about, but one game a week, not having to, not having to kind of rotate the team very much and uh, being able to have Ange talking to them all week and training them all week for that particular game is going to count massively for us. And so I think it is, you know, it's doable that we continue in the top two or three. Do I think it's going to happen? You know, I'm a Spurs fan, so my instinct is is to say, of course not. I would never be so lucky in my toxic controlling relationship with this club. <laughs> but, you know, crazier things have happened. And if we won the league this season, people would say, but it wasn't as crazy as when Leicester won the league. So it could happen. We need a lot of luck. We need, with injuries especially, and probably to um, to invest in a couple of positions in January. But could it happen? Could we continue it? Absolutely. Do I think we're going to beat Chelsea on Monday and it be an incredible night? Yes, I do. I feel really confident about it. And I think it's going to be an amazing night. And then if we then beat Wolves, I think we'll beat Villa as well. And then we can go to Man City and really shake it up. I said before this game, before Chelsea, uh, and before the Fulham and Palace games, I think I said if we can go into those games not not having been beaten, then I think we will go and beat Chelsea. It'll be a huge night for Spurs. So I've got to stick with that. And therefore, I say if we beat Chelsea, I think we can beat Wolves and Villa and then make it a massive night at the Etihad as well. 
Yeah, I think it does come down massively to injuries because we're so short in specific areas with pitch center back. If Madison gets injured, if Sonny gets injured, uh, any of the fullbacks for a long stretch of time, the goalkeeper. I mean, there's so many players in this team where it's so pivotal that they don't get injured. So for me, it's it's literally balls down to the injuries and if we can stay clear of those injuries for the remaining part of the season. But where, where's your head at, HG? Look, if I'm honest... Eight wins and two draws, I think kind of flatters Spurs a little bit based on the performances in the games. There have been a few games that maybe we maybe we should have drawn instead of one. HG, we, we only do lost. delusion here. I'm sorry. We only do oh, delusion. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm joking. The performance can stay. Like I think I think we'll, that's definitely sustainable. We're playing well. We're playing much better than we did last year. So I don't, I don't have any worry about us sustaining the performance. Even if we were to lose one of our more important players... I mean, we lost Bissouma for a game and we we won that one. So, like, Bissouma, it, it's weird. I feel like people are forgetting just how important Bissouma was in those first five or six <laughs> games because we all thought, wow, what a player. This guy is holding the midfield together and suddenly we lose him for a game and now it's like, Bissouma who? No, we're worried about Defen Van de Fen or we're worried about other people. So, like... HG, I, I, I'm hearing. I, 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 I'm actually hearing people now say that Hoybier is just as good as Basuma. By the way, after that one yeah, performance, was, <laughs> I, I, I love Hoybier, but not as a six. That is not. That's not going to be his thing. Like I, I just, we, we've got some more difficult games coming up. I do think they are more difficult. Chelsea is Chelsea. It doesn't matter how bad they are, you know, in their own mm. stadium, they, they will raise their game. We know they will. Um, Wolves away. Will they beat Man City? So again, you, you never know. But. It feels as if Spurs should, if we think about ourselves, we should only get better. Our performances have been very <coughs> good. Our results yeah. have been very good. But actually, we should only get better. And so I'm excited to see what will happen. Look, I don't expect us to be top at Christmas. Uh, I think we've got seven or eight league games in December alone. So there's a load of football to be played. But do I think we'll be within five points of top? Yeah, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, it just depends on how other teams do because, you know, we've seen that, I mean, I've seen today a lot of people say that the top four, this is the most points that the top four has ever had after 10 games. Like, we're not the only team that's flying is basically the mm. issue. And, you know, Liverpool have to play Man City after the international break. Arsenal will have more away games to navigate. So we, you just don't know. But for Spurs to be where we are is fantastic. And, you know, in, in, like in, in 10 games time, could we have 50 points? Maybe. We could win. We could win eight and lose two. I could see that happening. It's it, it, it's a crazy league this season. But I do feel that Spurs really, our performances can improve more than our results can. If that makes sense. HD, just out of interest, you said some of the we feel some of the results maybe the the points tally has been flat. Would uh, it's flattering us a bit? What games do you think we maybe? got lucky in it. Paul, I, can, like, I give you the Liverpool game. I think we can all agree we got very lucky in that one. But what other, do you think there are other games maybe we got points we didn't deserve to get? Define deserve. I mean, if you're 1-0 down after 96 minutes against Sheffield United and you win the game, I mean, like, I, I don't think that would happen very often. I think most times even Sheffield United would see that out. So, I mean, lucky is the wrong word because we, we, we've not stopped, you know, to, to quote that Ange phrase, mm. we haven't really stopped but I, look, I think I think the Man United game on another day, they score twice in the first half and we probably don't win that one. They had their chances in that first half. It, it's more about the fact that Spurs this season, we have taken advantage of other teams' mistakes. The Fulham goals are a prime example. We didn't really create much, but they gave us two good chances and we took them both and won the game. And so I feel as if that that's really what Spurs are. We, we've made a few mistakes. Other teams haven't taken advantage, but we have taken advantage of theirs. And so we deservedly top. But I feel like, you know, you, you could play those games another 100 times and maybe we'd have 18 points instead of 26. And it, it feels as if a lot of things have kind of fallen our way. Partly about through time. our own quality. But, and about partly time though, HG. <laughs> no, of course, of course. I mean, like, I, I, I'm not annoyed that it's happened, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm just aware that, like, you know, and if I take my Spurs hat off for a second, if I look at the, the other three teams that are in the top four with us, probably one certainly one maybe two have actually played better than us i don't think arsenal have been great so mm -hmm. you know we're not the only ones to have got very good results and not much else but i just yeah i i, I i'm i'm just excited that spurs can actually get better because i really do think we can mm, yeah i agree sim what's your mm. thoughts i think at the moment we're obviously we've had a fantastic start to the season 
given the fact that we have no European football, um, we're out of the Carabao Cup as well. We can focus largely on one game a week, apart from obviously in December, it's going to be pretty crazy. Everyone, But hey, that's the same case for everyone. Um, I think give, the fact that I, I'm looking at our first 11, and if we can keep our first 11 fit, I, I don't see a major weakness. In, in Apart from maybe you could say the wingers, you could say maybe they could contribute more to goals and assists. But right now, I'm not seeing like a glaring weakness in that first 11. And we've seen teams... Um, in specific years where maybe they have less, well, like when Chelsea didn't have um, European football one year, they went on to win the league. We saw it with Leicester. We saw last season with Newcastle, they didn't have European football, they went on to get top four. I remember Arsenal, the one year they didn't have European football, it really um, accelerated their process a lot. And they went from mid table to nearly, oh, getting champion, nearly getting Champions League. So I no think. No one's done it though since this Man City dominance though. Sorry? No one's challenged Man City since the Man City dominance in that. Fashion. Yeah, and that that's going to be very, very difficult. Um, I'm not saying I'm not saying we're going to win the league, but I, I don't see a reason why we should expect a massive drop-off in performance level throughout the season, given all these factors, unless maybe a, a centre-back has an injury for a real extended period, like maybe three, like three months or something, then maybe... We, we we can start to work. We saw how it even affected Arsenal last season when Saliba got injured, how much it, it, they dropped off, just one injury um, at the back end of last season. But I'm thinking how I'm looking at Tottenham this season so far. And even the games against Fulham, the games against Palace, uh, um, maybe even like Bournemouth away, like we weren't exceptional. We were we were just very solid. We were, I think I don't think we get enough credit for how v solid we've been defensively because we've played some really great football going forward. And Ange's philosophy is all about dominating the ball and and putting the opposition under pressure. And I think that's been a, a big emphasis. And people talk about Tottenham as I said that they're this like gung ho team. And and to an extent we are because we do obviously take a lot of risk. But we've been so good defensively. Um, Ange even pointed that out that after the it was after the Fulham game uh, he was asked about what they can improve he said going forward we're not at the level we want to be just yet and he said the defensive side of the game is winning us points at the moment that he explicitly said that and I and I and I genuinely believe that I think Van de Ven and Romero have been exceptional um so far defensively and I think if we can just carry on this uh how how we're defending at the moment and kind of being very resolute uh defensively and obviously keep improving our attacking phase of the game where we're creating more chances we're scoring more goals and that's hopefully going to improve and we even see it in spurts like in the the, the palace game the second goal brilliant team move brilliant team goal so we showed we can do it. we've shown it throughout the season we can that element is improving but the first thing to get right was clearly our defense because last season was our worst defensive display uh, I think in Premier League history or one of. So that has been a massive positive. So I think that has gone under the radar when it comes to sustainability of results. I'm not seeing a team for me at the moment who's getting lucky results. I don't. Be I really don't believe that. What I'm seeing is a team who have come up against a series number of challenges, a team in its infancy of its project. And then even in the games that HG has pointed out, apart from the Liverpool game where I truly accept we were very lucky to get that win and I don't think we deserved three points. Maybe a point would have been more fair. I don't think we deserve three points in the Liverpool game. I, I think that's the only result, in my opinion, that I think that we've generally not deserved to uh, to get in, in, so far this season. I think all the other results, I think we've we've deserved to get them. Um, and I think I've seen the team who in that Man United game, yes, we had difficulties in the first half, but we overcame them and we answered the questions that Man United asked us in that first half with our response. And then they struggled to deal with us. Same with Palace. We had massive struggles in that first half to create chances and we answered the questions they were asking us. Same with Sheffield United. And that's a really impressive and overlooked element of this team that they keep being asked difficult questions uh, and they're coming up with different challenges and we keep finding answers at the moment and we keep finding solutions to the problems that are dealt to us and it's not so easy to do that and I think we've been doing that on a regular basis and to, and hopefully we get to a stage where we're asking more questions in the first half than we're being asked because at the moment we're we're starting games a bit slow and, and we're under a bit of difficulty but we keep finding solutions to overcome it which is great but hopefully the more we get used to the system the better we're going to get and the hopefully the better we'll start games and all of a sudden we can 
put their man, the opposition under the cosh early on and it'll be even more difficult for the opposition to deal with us especially when we're taking leads and stuff like that uh, early doors and creating more chances so for me I don't see why results wise maybe not eight wins and two draws every 10 games but I don't see the, the big thing for me is not even being top of the league I think it's what's being overlooked is we're 10 points uh, uh, will be eight points now clear of six that is massive to be to 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 have that after ten games. And if I'm before the season, obviously everyone wanted a top four, top five finish to get jump back in the Champions League. We're now put ourselves in a position where I'm not saying it's wrapped up, but we've been extraordinarily positioned to be eight points clear of sixth after ten games. And everyone would have been um, like so delighted with that. So I don't see why that that gap per se can't extend. Mm. I don't see a reason why not. Yeah, it most definitely can extend, 100%. But it, it always comes down back to the injuries. And I know HG was saying, you know, everyone was saying about Bissouma and if he gets injured, we're screwed. And Hoybier came in and, and stepped in admirably well. But I think that if Bissouma was injured for a longer stretch of time, we would feel that. And I think like it's the same for a lot of the other players that we mentioned. So I, I do believe that everything that's been said so far on the topic has been spot on and we can sustain this form, but it all comes down to injuries in my opinion. And we need to replenish the squad in January and we need to get a uh, better you know, understudy players or not even understudy players, squad players, you know, players for the squad we need because we're just too short in certain areas at the moment. And I don't think with Spurs' luck, what we've had, you know, over so many years, it's going too well at the moment and we're using up too much luck at the early stage of the season. So it's all my Spurs hat and what I've been through for so many years being a Spurs fan, you know that unlucky moments are going to come in the season and those un unlucky moments will probably come in the form of injuries. So we need to, to back ourselves up in those situations because if one of Romero or Van de Ven gets injured and we're stuck playing an Eric Dyer or Ashley Phillips, who's never played at this level before, you know, I don't know if the defence is going to be the same. I don't think it will be. So I think it's a very, it hinges on, on very fine margins um, if we can sustain can, it or can, not. Can I be deluded for a second? Can I be deluded yes, for a please. second? Yes, please. Yes, like, please. When, when we signed Van de Ven, just before the season started, I spoke to a lot of Spurs fans who were annoyed that it hadn't happened three or four weeks earlier because he needed time to get used to the system. Well, mm. either Van de Ven doesn't care about that or actually the, the system for defending under Ange is hey, look, you're going to be mopping up. That's pretty much your job. You, we, we, you're not going to be under the cost for any length of time. And so, look, if I want to be deluded, maybe those centre-half options that we have instead of Romero and Van der Ven can do that just as well. Maybe. Maybe Phillips at 19, 18, whatever he is, maybe he can step up and be that guy. I, I, mean, look, I don't know if I really believe that, but if I want to be deluded for a second... I, I, I can I can make myself do that. Like the, the the key thing about Spurs this season is that we haven't really needed to defend. That's mm. the best part. We have the ball, we keep the ball, and and really the annoying part is that we haven't used it as well as we as we would like. We haven't created the chances that maybe we could have done. If you take away, you know, the what the hour, the last hour at Burnley where we got five goals and the first half against Luton when we didn't score, we haven't really created that much. We've not looked that great going forward. So mm. when that improves, which I'm sure it will, then okay, um, we, we'll start talking. But the, the defensive side of things, as much as it clearly is important and we do want someone better, maybe people can come in and, and not have to worry about too much. They'll, they'll just be there to to mop up because the rest of the team has got the ball the whole time. HG, can I give a pro and a, a pro and a kind of against what you've just said? Of course. The, Absolutely. the pro is the, the, the reason why I think you're not far wrong is actually I think the key to how our defense has improved is kind of twofold. Firstly, that Ange has brought in a system and coached them in a way that every single player is improving. And therefore, I think that Eric Dyer and Ashley Phillips will be being coached on a daily basis as to how they, as and when they slot in, will have to defend in this system. And therefore, I think they will naturally be far better than, or Eric Dyer will be far better than he was last season because he is being coached better. However, the, the, the against what you said is that I think Mickey van der Ven is the absolute key and actually possibly the one injury that we especially can't get away with because the reason it seems like we're just mopping up is because he is just mopping up. So yeah. he, it's his pace, in my opinion, that is allowing us to get away with Poro being so far up and Destiny being so far up and every so very rarely, but every so often Romero being out of position. 
However, if we have to have Dyer come in for Van der Ven, his slowness on the turn will not allow him to get back in time. He's actually relatively quick once he gets going, but it takes him about 50 meters to get going. <laughs> so that's um, that's kind of my fear. I don't know enough about Ashley Phillips pace wise, but I wouldn't want him to come have to come in and say, oh, by the way, you are the linchpin of this entire system. Uh, look, and then the other thing in terms of the, the defensive improvement is because we all of them know that they have that pace to cover from Mickey van der Ven, they are now just defending from 10 yards inside the opposition's half. And that mm -hmm. is the reason why we are defensively so much better because they're not facing nearly as many defensive actions because we are just winning the ball back so far up the pitch. And, you know, I'm, maybe we were going to get onto this or not, but Conte, I don't know whether he's watching, but if he's watching, maybe he is currently um, like rethinking his entire management model because this the way that this works goes expressly against everything he said and we are far better defensively than he is, than his teams were despite the fact he had an extra center half and he was all about no no we defend our goal we defend our goal and then we'll break and it, it's clear that that is not working in modern football and um 57 year old Ange just got the run on him when it comes to that but, you know, to be fair to Conte, you know, he did want a Bastoni and he got a long lay at, at left centre back and, and, you know, all those stuff. And if 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 Conte would have had uh, Mickey van der Ven to play left centre back and Romero was right centre back, I do think we'd be a lot better in defence, even under Conte. Did you see Bastoni um, against Kane in that England game the other night? <laughs> Forget <laughs> Bastoni. I said if we had... I know you, look, Bast Bastoni is a top defender. Yeah, he was poor that he night. Is, I, I, I actually disagree. I know where you're coming from, but I disagree on the basis that we were just calling teams on so much mm. that, uh, you know, and I know it worked in his days at Chelsea and it worked in Inter when, in Inter where they're all Italian, they grow up, they know how to and it, it, they love defending. And it worked when he but first came to Spurs to get us Champions League. It did, it did work for a run when, before the players got pissed off with him, but I just think there's more to it. There's just more to it. But I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I'm not, I'm not defending, you know, the fact that the club won't pay top, Dollar, but the fact is, the club will not pay top dollar, and Ange Postacoglu is now making it seem like we don't need to pay top dollar as long as you get the players with the correct attributes yeah. for the style that you want, and he's able to mm. do it with players who don't cost £70 million. Pounds. Mm. It's fair enough. All right, let's move on to the next topic, and we're going to talk about our favourite Uruguayan, Rodrigo Bentancor. We saw him get a few minutes against Crystal Palace, and he's come out with a quote today saying he wants to be called up to the Uruguay squad. He's ready to play. HG, do you think that we should be starting him now? He should be coming into the team already, or is it a bit too soon and, and we should bide our time with Rodrigo? Um, like I didn't think I'd see him on Friday night. I was ecstatic yeah. that I got to because he's yeah. been my favourite Spurs player since he joined. Um, I just, it's a tough one because I think you know, most people, when you think back to what Benton Kerr did before his injury, that guy starts, he's in our, he's in our best 11. But yeah. Papsar has done very little wrong. And so it would feel a bit of a kick to, to just put Benton Kerr straight in, even if it is Chelsea. So it, it's a tough one. I. I would be tempted to put Ben Dinkert in. I would. Um, I, I know that we don't need to, um, but still, he, he's so good on the ball and he's so good at making those runs that, frankly, Pepsar doesn't make those runs into the box. He's not much of an attacking threat. We see Pepsar doing lots defensively, which is great. And maybe he does that better than Ben Dinkert would. But it's <laughs> if it wasn't Chelsea, I'd be saying no. Right. I mean, if it was a, if it was a, if it was the next game, all the way, I'd be going. We'll keep Sar in. We don't need to do it. I, I know that's true, but uh, he is. I do think his ceiling is better than than uh, than Sar's right now. That's certainly who he is, and and like, like having him around means that like it's weird. You put if Hoiberg is in that team with Benton Kerr, those two have always played well together. They seem to understand each other's games really well. So. There is a massive benefit, not just for you know for, to start games, but even for the last 15, 20 minutes, if Hoiberg comes on, that we, we, we really aren't losing much at all. But um, yeah, it, it, it's tough. If Saar starts, I won't be upset, but I do think Bentancur is the better player. Yeah, I agree that Bentancur is the be better player. I mean, Saar's 20 years of age, so I mean, he's got a lot of developing to do still. But isn't it a bit of a risk after such a long injury to just throw him straight in, especially in a game like Chelsea? It's definitely a risk. I mean, it's a, it's a risk not to. Like, like everything is kind of, you're just mitigating it in some in some respect. But I just, 
like it, 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 it is tough because I, he to me he is in, he's enough of uh, he's more oh my gosh I can't speak English anymore <laughs> he is better it's simply put, simply put he is better than Saar right mm. and so we don't need to risk it we don't need to push it but I didn't think we'd see him at Palace and he was on the bench and was willing to come on and was perfectly fine for 10 minutes so yeah like 10 minutes isn't much I just it, it's a tough one like I think Saar will start mm. I do think Saar will start but it's it, it's not a bad position to be in like we've, mm. we've got a, a person coming back on the bench who may well be better than the ones and the same is true of Johnson and Richarlison the people that might actually be better for that role we don't need to rush them back in I think mm. with um I think with Bentancourt, there's slightly too many variables at this stage for him to be starting. It wouldn't surprise me at all, and I don't think Bentancourt would l will love this if this is the case. But it wouldn't surprise me at all if Big Ange just said to Bentancourt, look, in January, Papsar and Ibasuma are going to be going to the African Cup of Nations. Yeah. And that is when I need you to be absolutely at your top peak form, back as you were before your injury. When you come back from an ACL... <laughs> you may be fit to come back, but are you quite the same player yet? So I, th I think that's a variable, and I'd say Big Ant will probably be saying, we're going to drip feed you in, starting with five, ten minutes at Palace, 20 minutes next time, half an hour next time, and then maybe, you know, some more opportunities at half an hour. But in the knowledge that when it comes to the Christmas break and then January, he's going to be his most important player because... You know, if he puts him in against Chelsea and he breaks down, does his ACL again, that's literally no good for anyone. He'll have to go into the transfer market. And from all the reports in the transfer rumours at the moment, they're looking at midfielders anyway. So maybe they feel very strongly that Hoiberg is going to go. And what they wouldn't want is to have to buy a midfielder and him have to go straight in and be the mainstay from January onwards, I don't think. So that would be my thought. It's unbelievable going back uh, to what HG said, saying that, you know, don't really mind if Bentancourt plays because we're doing so well and Pape Matasari is, is you know, we don't really need him uh, at this moment in time, um, like a, a complete necessity. And like, you cast your mind back to when he got injured. It was like the end of the world. Like we, the season was pretty much done as soon as Bentancourt got injured. So that's another testament to Ange and the coaching methods and, and the players that he's brought on in this time. But Sim, you think um, it's too soon for Bentancourt to start? I'd probably say it is, but I'm obviously not on the medical team, so it's hard for me to say. Obviously, Ben Tenkor is itching to get back into the team and itching to get back playing football again. And um, we've seen as Ange Postecoglou say how, how Ben Tenkor has been knocking on his door every day, pretty much, or every week, saying, I want to play, I want to get back in, I'm ready, I'm ready. Obviously, Ben Tenkor, those quotes indicate even further that he thinks he's ready, he's not injured anymore, he's, he's ready he's to ready start. for a month now. Exactly, <laughs> that's the thing. And there are some players, let's be honest, there are some players where... They are that good. Like, if once they're fit, you just have to put them straight back in. Like, I remember a few years ago when um, I think we were when we were in the title race of Leicester. I remember Vertonghen got injured for like two months or something, and Wimmer comes in and he played really, really well with me. He had a great run and he and he was a really great understudy for Vertonghen. But as soon as Vertonghen's back, he's straight in because he's that good. You can't, you can't not. Like, same with Kane. Like he was, I remember lead up to Champions League final, right? He was injured, um, having a lot of um, trouble with injuries. But as soon as he's fit, he's back in because he's that good. You, um, you just have to put them straight back in because yeah. they're that level. Now, if you would ask me uh, when Bentancur got injured, is he at that level? He probably was because he was probably one of the best centre mids in the league at the time, the way he was playing. He was playing unbelievable. He was playing at such a high level, probably in the form of his life when he picked up that injury. It was such a tragic um, timing for him. So the, I guess the question is, is he, is he at that level of player? where if he, that he's just that good, you just got to put him in as soon as he's fit and available? Or is it a case of Saar has earned his place and even though Ben Tenkor is, it was brilliant before his injury, is there any reason to take Saar out at the moment? Because I'm guessing Saar is probably the person you're going to take out unless you're thinking, is he a challenger for the number six position? But I'm probably set of thinking, I guess that's a different question. Is he a six or is he an eight? We're not quite, not 100% sure. I'd probably put him in an eight. But... I, I mean, just Basuma think considers himself an eight. Yeah, also that's also true. I just think for the time being, there's no reason to take 
as much as how as much as Bentancourt has been brilliant, there's, if if Saar wasn't playing as well as he has been, I think there is a case to put Bentancourt straight back in. But I just think there's no reason to take Saar out at the moment. He's playing consistently well. I think it's important to show Saar as well that he's trusted by Postacoglu, and that doesn't mean even though he's in good form, oh the the, the more senior plays back, so you have to lose your place just because he's a fit and available. I think Postacoglu wants to send a message saying even though you're 20 years old, I trust you. You're a, you're good. You're a big part of my plans, and you're consistently going to be playing as long as you're playing well you have that spot and I think that's a good message to send so as much as I want to see Bentancourt back as soon as possible and I can't wait to see him back on the pitch and back to the levels he was showing pre-injury there's just no reason to take Sarah at the moment considering how he's playing yeah, I completely agree with what Barnaby was saying about the AFCON. You know, we, we're we going to need him desperately at that moment in time when Basuma and Pape Matasar go for those. I think we've got three or four games, including the FA Cup in January, which which they could potentially miss. And we can't be having any recurrence of an injury or any sort of injury that could come from that ACL from overplaying him from now until then. So I would like him to, to stay on the bench for now. To be honest, not maybe we got seven games in January, so he can in December, so he can start one or games here and there um, when the games are overloaded. But I want to keep him as fresh as we can for January because we, we that's when we're really going to need him. So, um, yeah, question for the guys though quickly. I like, guess start with Barnaby. Where do you see Ben Tenkel when he's fit? Is it more of an eight or more of a six, or can he just do both? Do you do not? Are you not bothered about where which one? Yeah. I think one of the exciting things is that they can all I think they can all do all of them do you know what I mean I, I mean apart from mm. I think there's only there's only matters who can do matters do you know what I mean yeah. but, and and you know we're looking at a bit of a downgrade when Gio comes in but I but Gio is a clearly a very talented player Leo Messi really rates him and and maybe if he got a run of games which would be you know only because of a matters injury I think then he could do much better than we've seen him in a Spurs shirt but in terms of the other players even Hoiberg I think plays more like an eight for Denmark and scores loads of goals for Denmark uh, and yeah scored that goal against Marseille uh, away for us, which was vital. So they can all play any of those roles. And I think that suits Ange so much because Ange, he's talked about it. He doesn't think formations are just about one player sticking here or there. It's about rotation. And I wanted to say on a similar thing, Pat Matassar does a lot of underappreciated leg work and engine work in this team. And it would not surprise me one bit if Ange is like, oh, you know, Maybe Bentancur is ready, but I'd rather bring Bentancur in for a Basuma if Basuma gets suspended again than lose the legs that Papsar is, is giving us. Because it's that example against Fulham, which is the best example. There are so many of those, but it, it's the one where he got back and got that clearing header in mm. away from home. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's like he does so much of that that isn't quite as sexy looking as that, but it's really vital interceptions, reading the game and using his kind of never ending engine to really help us. That I don't think it's quite as simple as a lot of the Spurs fan base do in terms of, oh, he's the he's the least talented player in those two, so he's the one that Bentecou should come in. I think it'll be a matter of rotating all three of them, potentially four of them, when it comes to who's fit, you know, who's putting in the most amount of yards, literally data-wise, in each game, and resting and rotating. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty certain I've seen in games, I think maybe it's the Fulham one especially, but even on Friday night, I'm sure it happened, that Porro pushes further ahead of Saar, and actually, Poro is the one who's being tasked to combine with Kulisevsky and maybe create down that right-hand side. And Saar is really more... The, the, I mean, it's, to say he fetches it is, is, is unreal because it's, it's not true. He's, he made the run for the first goal himself to start off the pallets. But I, I, I do feel that the, 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 the quality on the ball when, when it comes to passing or creating maybe isn't there with Saar. But he's very good at getting it and giving it and very good at making simple passes. And like I think going long-term... He's the closest thing to an actual six that we have. Like when he's at his best, that's going to be his role. I do believe that. But uh, yeah, right now as an eight, like n none of us are calling for him to be dropped. It's not like Richarlison, where we're all thinking, "Hey, maybe we could do something better quite easily." L losing Saar means losing something. It's not a question of just saying we want to be better. We know that that the people coming in maybe can't give as much as he can in certain areas. Where do you see Ben Tancor? More of a six or an eight or both? Do you think he'd do either? I think, I mean, he was a six for Juventus and I never really rated him. When, as soon as he came to Spurs and was an eight, I, I couldn't believe the player I was watching. I couldn't believe that Juventus hadn't used him in that way. However, in, in a midfield three or in five or however you want to view it, the Spurs right now, to be that middle one, what Basuma is, Ben mm. can do that with his eyes closed. I have no mm. doubt about that. But when I want someone breaking into the box he might be the best midfielder we have at making those runs. And he proved that last season. So 
Mm. To me, Bentancur can be either a six or an eight. I, I do mm. think Bissouma is more of a six. I don't want Bissouma making those runs, really, because he never did that for Brighton and he's never really done it for Spurs. But you go back to pre-season, he made those runs every game and was good at it. Mm. So it, we, we have a lot of players that can do a lot of things. And so I think it is about that combination. Like, who, who provides the energy? Who provides the, the nous? Who provides the, the metronomic passing? If we get one of those in, in each role, it doesn't matter so much. Yeah. Mm. Can I just bring up something that I think is really relevant to not only what HG is saying, but also um, what you said about Kevin Vimmer earlier on. Mm. What I find really exciting about Spurs at the moment, and, and because Ange is now coaching the players to a point where they've all got confidence and they're all playing better, is that when it comes to the moment where and it may happen this January or next summer or whatever, where there are some squad players who haven't had enough game time, then just similarly to how it was back when it was great under Poch, we are now going to be able to get big transfer fees for those players who are not getting a lot of squad time. So back in the day, I think we got I think we got nigh on 20 million for Kevin Vimmer, you know. 18, I believe it was, yeah. Yeah, because he played, you know, like you said, 10, 15 games in a row, did well, kept us towards the top of the league. And now, let's say, you know, I don't think it'll happen, but let's say Bentico comes in and Pap Sar doesn't play for six months or eight months, and then he comes to us in a year or two years' time and says, I want to leave. He, perhaps I would go for huge money. Now, I don't think mm -hmm. that will happen, but what I'm saying is those squad players are now going to take on a worth again, and we are going to be able to make money in, which will allow us to spend more money the other way. And it seems so simple now that we've got it, but actually that four or five years that we've had where we've got these managers who are not training the players well or giving them confidence has ruined our football club for those mm. that period of time and it's just exciting that now we're back to a place where that's happening again i think that's a good point and i'm just thinking about this though like well, we've talked about all the midfielders there's one name we just haven't mentioned and haven't brought up and that's ollie skip like we just haven't even he considered him as an option do you do we think his time is he's on borrowed time at this point at tottenham now it's a shame to even talk about because i was so excited about when he broke into the team yeah. about him being a big player for us you're and now we're not even considering him an option you're talking about probably the best performer i know the bar was very low but in the nuno era in the beginning of the conte era you know he came in and, and was one of the top midfielders for spurs at that moment in time but when you're looking at the technical ability that all our midfielders have i'm not sure where ollie skip fits in anymore to be honest I think he's a rhythm player. Uh, I've got friends who are huge Norwich fans, and he's the most. They say he's the most talented player they had in Norwich for many, many years. It would not surprise me a little who's, bit. Who's second most his, talented? Uh, Darren Huckabee, uh, <laughs> Emmy Buendia. They also love. Um, and then obviously after that, uh, Alex Pritchard. Um, but, <laughs> Madison. Uh, Surely Madison's got to be up there and too. Matters. Yeah, yeah, Madders. <laughs> and Madders actually did his ACL when he was at Norwich. I didn't realise mm. he'd done an ACL before. But anyway. Oh, well, anyway. I didn't. Anyway, I think it wouldn't surprise me if Oli Skip got a Premier League loan, like a lower Premier League loan, maybe in January or maybe next summer for a year. He's still pretty young, but what he needs and has never had is a season of Premier League football playing every game. I still think he's a talented player and a good enough player. I just think he needs t uh, game time and therefore rhythm. I don't know what you think, HG. No, I mean, this is like, if, you, if you assume that he's never going to be used in the medicine role, right, that he's either going to be a six or an eight on the other side, um, the other players are, are ahead of him, right? Saar's ahead of him, Bentancur, Hoybjerg, Basuma, they're, they're all ahead of him. And so, yeah, like if I'm, if I'm Fulham and I think I'm going to lose my biggest defensive midfielder in January and I want another pair of legs to do something, he could really suit the way they play um, because Paulinha is, is a firefighter and p picks up with the odd goal, but basically that's his role. Skip needs to play, and when he does play in a system that suits him, he's definitely Premier League quality. I've no doubt about that. But you know, whether he's going to get minutes at Spurs, not this season. So I, I do think that you know, any loans that will happen will happen at the end of January when African Nations is finished and we know kind of who we've got around. And if Heiberg does go, then maybe we think, OK, uh, if we don't get a replacement, then, then Skip becomes that guy um, in the rotation. But it's... Yeah, I, th I think for Skip, it's a shame because he is. He's 23. He's only really had that one season of football for Norwich. He's, he got injured under Conte. He's not really had a chance um, since then and uh, not, not for a run of games, really. And everyone remembers what happened at the end of last season when it was him and Hoiberg and the whole team stunk. And it had nothing to do with Skip. But people mm -hmm. remember the fact that he was in that side. And so it, it, it's rough on him. But I, yeah, I do think that you know, Barnaby's right. Alone for the second half of the season and and then we'll see what what there is because he, he's 
I, I don't want him to be the o- only there because he offers a club grown status for European football. Like I think yeah. he's better than that. And, yeah, 100%. and it, 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 it does feel as if that's, he's kind of going down that road and I don't want that. Mm. And it's, it's mad to think he was actually uh, ahead of the, in the pecking order than Pape Matasar when the season started. And then he didn't uh, play that well at Brentford and obviously Sars come in since then and, and the rest is history. But yeah, I think I do agree with you. Maybe a loan spell uh, to a lower tra- uh, Premier League team to get consistent game time is the way forward. But let's um, finish off the panel talking about the game this weekend against Chelsea. Well, not specifically about the game, but a, a moment in the game where we're going to see at the beginning where Pochettino, Maurizio Pochettino returns to the club and I'm not sure if either of you are going to the game but let's say you are going to the game how would you react uh, when Pochettino walks out that tunnel we'll start with you Barnaby uh, so I'm hoping to go to the game I've had a little whisper from a mate of mine who owns a big company that who has a box he reckons he might be able to get me a seat so let's let's see about that but secondly um, I think it might depend how many beers I've had um, <laughs> so bad, let, if you've had no beers what, what you what are you reacting and then go to it, our past yeah, five beers <laughs> I think I've had no, if I've had no beers I think I'd actually be respectful because I, I I love Poch I love what he did for the club and I really think he was almost given no option but to go to Chelsea because and this is my opinion you might disagree but he was flirting with Spurs so hard at the back end of last season in the summer with all those, I'm playing golf with the Spurs legends again mm. for the 19th time <laughs> and all that stuff. And Levy took a very difficult decision not to call him, I think. And I think at the time, a lot of us were like, oh my God, like that is brave of Levy. This, you know, you're making a rod for your own back. But I think Levy saw something in Ange when he met Ange. It was like, I believe this guy. This guy is totally believable and likable and clearly worth a punt. So I don't think it was Poch's fault that he didn't come back to Spurs do I think he should have gone to Chelsea no but do I also think he had many other options no actually what I'm gutted about for him is that if he had just waited a bit longer bear in mind he'd waited a year already I think he might have been about to get the Man United job I think Ten Hag might be on even bigger borrowed time now if uh, Poch was available so in answer to your question no beers I'll be respectful and then a few beers i think i might just join in and i think it might i think it might be a bit spicy i do i think it might be a bit spicy so you think that that the general consensus from the fans will be negative towards him i think there'll be enough to make it spicy i think there'll be a lot of people who won't boo but i think there'll be enough who will that it'll it'll make it uncomfortable for him and i think just the fact that it's a chelsea game under the lights we're top of the league they're struggling I think the fans, even the fans who, who don't want to boo Pochettino, will want to make it as difficult for Chelsea as possible. And that will start from the moment they come out to warm up and carry on when they come out the tunnel and when Pochettino comes out. So there you go. It's, a, it's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? Because I'm hearing like different murmurings from different sections of the fan base where a lot of them being like, oh, he's Chelsea manager. Uh, I'm definitely going to boo him. You can't cheer an ex-Spurs player or manager that's gone over to play for Chelsea or manage Chelsea. 100% booing. And then uh, uh, on the other hand, I'm hearing, well, he did so much for the club. um, I can't do anything but show my respect to him and and clap him when he comes out. But then I'm hearing another section being like, you know what? I'm just going to ignore him. I'm not going to boo. I'm not going to cheer. I'm just going to act like he's not there and he's dead to me or, you know, stuff like that uh, where's your head at hg i think it comes down to how much you hate chelsea if i'm honest mm. because i you know i've not lived in england for 20 years right so that whatever rival we had for chelsea didn't really exist when i was there um, and so it's weird to watch it from afar i don't have the same hatred for chelsea that i do for arsenal i hate west ham more than i do chelsea so but if i imagine pochettino coming back as manager of west ham or as manager of arsenal i'm booing him Um, There's no doubt in my mind I'm booing him. So I think that's where it comes from. Like, yes, he did great for Spurs. But if you really hate Chelsea, and so many Spurs fans really do, then you will boo him. And it's not even him you're booing. It's the fact he is now associated with Chelsea. It's Chelsea that who you're booing. He comes back with Southampton or with Bournemouth or whoever. No one boos. Right? It is all due unto the fact that he's at Chelsea. So if I was there, I I, I don't think I would boo. I mean, like... I wouldn't clap him either. It's just because my focus is on Spurs. That's got to be the focus. Pochettino, frankly, is a bit of a sideshow in this one. And the fans need to concentrate on Spurs winning and the players need to concentrate on that. And Pochettino being the manager of the team we beat is irrelevant as long as we win the game. 
I this don't is, know. It's a bit like the Terry Wainbridge will they won't they handshake, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> will they won't they boo? It's got that kind of feeling to it. I want to I want to know your opinion. I don't know if either of you remember this moment, but in the early nineties, Glenn Hoddle came back to White Hart Lane as manager of Chelsea. I was a bit too young to remember it, so I don't know if either of you know or remember him coming back to White Hart Lane and what the reception was from the fans. I think it fits in a bit with what HD was saying, though. I think the rivalry wasn't nearly as bad then. I mean, I know that I, I, I've asked a few Chelsea fans. I know that the rivalry supposedly comes back from like the 80s and the 70s and the firms and stuff. But it's definitely ramped up for some reason over the last 15, 20 years. Because around the era of, you know, dare I say it, the Sol Campbell signing for Arsenal and whatever, it was all Arsenal. It wasn't about Chelsea then. It really wasn't. And that, I guess, I, I think it's ramped up since Abramovich because we look over there and they're like, wait, they were, they were bloody, they were way below us before the Abram, you know, certainly before they got Viali and under the latter days, Matthew Harding, Ken Bates, etc. So, yeah, I know that Hoddled was manager there. It didn't seem, I, I'm old enough to remember it. I was, so what was that, 94, they got the cup final with Hoddle. I was like 13, 14. It just didn't seem as big a thing back then. Um, but now I do think it'll be huge. But I, I know what HG's saying because, uh, yeah, West Ham, obviously, terrible as well. So, I don't know. So the thing is, like, I, I'd, I'd have been at that game, right? I had a season ticket then. So I'd have been at the game and I don't really remember much about Like, I know that, weirdly enough, Chelsea came to Spurs then and it was Sol Campbell's debut and they beat us. That would have been 92. Because I I remember not I remember walking out early so I didn't see Spurs score my mum killed me for it um, <laughs> I think I think a few years after that Chelsea thrashed us and I remember sitting in the in the Paxton Road end for that one so it's yeah I, I don't know but I, I don't the, the rivalry was nowhere near that bad I and mean, to be fair at that point I don't really even think there was a rivalry with West Ham either it was very much Spurs hate Arsenal Arsenal hate Spurs and London teams you want to beat them. But the, 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 the level of Spurs and Chelsea, it was kind of irrelevant at that point. Neither one of us was particularly good in the early 90s and the mid 90s. Chelsea had a bit of money, but Spurs had money. I mean, like get, getting to the cup final, again, it'd only been three years or two years since we'd been to the cup final and won it ourselves. It wasn't so our point, money then, though, was it? We may have had no. money, but it wasn't, it wasn't actually our money. <laughs> that, is, that is true. <laughs> it was our just fake money. Yeah, quite. <laughs> <laughs> I just like it's 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 a rough one, but you know, Hoddle going to Chelsea never felt like the the the, the deal with the devil that Pochettino going there has seemed mm. to be, um, mm. because Hoddle again like Hoddle was the club legend that played for thirteen years. Like th th there's very little that Hoddle would have done for Spurs to be like, oh, we'll forget that, right? Pochettino sadly had Pochettino left. We got to the Champions League final and it hadn't worked out. People would have been like, okay, well, sucks that you're going, but, you know, thanks for everything. But because he stayed that three months longer and people would start remembering that we'd actually been bad for 12 months, like, that, that affects things too. But, uh, yeah, I do think if you hate Chelsea, you will boo. It's that simple. And if you, if you don't hate them as much, then you'll be a bit more I mean, respectful is the wrong word, but you just, you'll appreciate what Pochettino did. Is there a case to say that maybe we boo before the game and then maybe cheer him after the game after we've tonked them? I think that's has to be yeah, the I don't know. If he, comes, if he comes onto the pitch after the game and we've beaten them 4-0, I'll happily cheer him. Not going to cheer yeah, him if we lose, though, are we? If we lose, no. <laughs> if we beat him, though. Hey, yeah, if, I'm down if for we that. Beat, if we beat them 3 or 4-0, then we just start singing Agent Pochettino. And that's it. <laughs> that's all we need to do. Because right? if Pochettino goes there and loses consistently... Surely that makes him still a Tottenham hero. I would love to see Spurs being 3-0 up in that second half and the whole stadium, a massive resounding, he's magic, you know. <laughs> that would, that, be, that would be great. That would be brilliant. And also possibly like his death warrant for as Chelsea manager. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think for me, I would I, I would I wouldn't boom. I would even though he is Chelsea manager, I'm not I obviously don't like Chelsea. I think my appreciation and love for Pochettino supersedes my hate for Chelsea. Whereas if he was Arsenal manager, my hate for Arsenal would supersede my hate of my love and appreciation of what Pochettino did. So it would be a different case. I don't like Chelsea, but I maybe don't, don't hate them as much as other people. And also considering the fact that it's his first time back at Tottenham since he's been sacked, we never really got to say goodbye or anything, did we? We never really got uh, uh, any like, 
I wouldn't say closure, but we never really got to show our appreciation for him um, after being sacked in any moment. So this is the first time you have that. So I would like a little moment at the with beginning the of the game. With a Chelsea badge on his chest? Even with a Chelsea badge on on his chest. But I'm all for, as soon as the game starts, you're getting sacked in the morning. He's tragic, you know. It will bring, bring, it, bring, it all, bring it all out. I don't really care. Throw it at him, whatever you want. I just, I would like, uh, considering it's his first year, I'm saying maybe like next year, if he's still in a job, like if he comes back next year, you give him give him hell like it's whatever I just think the very first time we're going to see him since Tottenham since he's been sacked I would like to see a little moment just of acknowledgement of the good the good job he did for Tottenham and, and, and you know how much we appreciate it but I just think literally that and then and, but I think any other time I'm happy for it to be a spicy atmosphere or I'm, whatever I'm with, be I'm with Ben that should happen at 3-0 up and I think that would be one of the most brilliant shit housing moments in football if and the, do a 3-0 up the whole fan <laughs> Chant his his chant at three 0 That would be so brilliant. Yeah, it's just we brilliant. want you to stay ringing around <laughs> yeah. the stadium. But but like <laughs> if if you get like it's funny that you know the away coaches obviously park in that corner of the ground and they have to walk past the goal. They have to walk past a bunch of home fans to get kind of into the stadium. That if someone was that inclined, they could go there and and make it almost a walk of shame to begin with. Like people mm. get into the stadium that early to, to buy their beer and whatever, <clears throat> but you could get a whole bunch of Spurs fans who literally will send there and they could yell abuse at him. I'm not saying I would, but if you're there, that those players, they have to make that walk. Behind what the time goal. would that so be, HG? I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 90 minutes before the game starts, probably. <laughs> Uh, but it just doesn't sit right with me that anyone would cheer him before the game starts. I just don't think that that should be a situation. After the game, maybe, if we had won. But for someone coming to the Spurs stadium in a Chelsea tracksuit to come and try and beat us, it just doesn't sit right with me to cheer him, whoever you are, to be honest. So uh, Pochettino doesn't get that, that um, leeway, in my opinion. For me, he does. All right, but I, think... I don't, look. I just don't, I, I I don't have that. I I have a bit of animosity for Chelsea. I'm, I'm saying, if it was Arsenal, I'd fully agree with you. Chelsea, I don't like them, but my hate for them isn't that. I mean, intense. Pochettino was the one that came out and said Chelsea are our biggest rivals. It's not Arsenal. Yeah, because they were footballing wise, they were. And and he's gone there. And Battle look, of the I, Battle of I, the Bridge I, for me. Yeah, I was I was sat in the fucking Chelsea end for the Battle of the Bridge. That was a difficult night. <laughs> that was a difficult <laughs> uh, night. Yeah, and look, I don't True. blame him for going there because that was his probably only option on the table. And he was, like Barnaby said, he was flirting with Spurs uh, the whole summer, and we didn't take him up on the option, and we went for Postecoglou. And to be honest, I'm much happier that we have gone for Postecoglou over Pochettino, mm. the return of Pochettino, by the way. But the fact of the matter is, he's a Chelsea manager now, and he's the enemy, and that's and that's what it boils down to. Do, do you guys Give think he's? Hell. Do you guys think he's? Um, obviously, he's struggled a bit. Is he? Do you think he's in a bit of trouble, or do you think he's uh, maybe going to have the patience of the Chelsea board? I think um, I'll just go very briefly. I think anybody managing there would be in trouble at the moment. I don't. Mm. I think he's doing as good a job as he possibly could. I mean, I, I, I watched their matches, and I don't have a clue who half those players are. And I, and I don't <laughs> doubt that they're incredibly talented youngsters. Like my cousins are Chelsea fans; they don't have a clue who they are either. And I, you know, basically, it's all good. It's all well and good buying the most talented youngsters in Europe and the world, but you can't put them all in at the same time. Anyone who plays football manager knows that. You literally mm -hmm. you can't. You have to bed them in with experience and knowledge of the league and all of that kind of stuff. So I think he's actually doing a fine job there. But that, but Chelsea fans are idiots, so they will try and hound him out if he doesn't get them up the table soon. <laughs> absolutely Chelsea fans most definitely idiots but um, let's finish at that point but thank you so much to Barnaby and HG for coming and joining us today HG tell the people where they can find you cheers uh, so the Cheese Room podcast obviously um, we have shows after each game we also do YouTube stuff Mondays Wednesdays and Fridays so there'll be a show tonight where we'll talk about obviously the season so far maybe which players have played the best for Spurs who, who we've liked the most but uh, yeah, we have YouTube shows three times a week, the pods after the game, and just content if you're interested. Um, there's loads of Spurs content, but we like to think that we're slightly different in some way, as all of us do. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's good fun to be part of. Brilliant. Well, thanks for coming on. Great Spurs content on the Cheese Room. Link is in the live chat right now. So go and hit that subscribe button. Barnaby, you did tell the people where they could find you at the beginning of the stream, but why not tell them again? 
I'll tell them again for those people who are giving you that sweet, sweet watch time uh, and full engagement. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've just started the Spurred On podcast, which is available on all your usual podcast platforms daily, uh, 12, 15 minute episodes, all the old for, uh, kind of formats, match reviews, match previews, uh, transfer gossip. Uh, so go to uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast. And also I film myself doing it. So it's on YouTube as well. <laughs> go to youtube.com forward slash at Barnaby Slater underscore and HG, great to meet you. I'd love to have you on my show and you boys, you'll have to come on the show too. It's been amazing being on this. Thanks so much. 100%. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Big up to the panel. Big up to all of you guys in the live chat as well. And we'll see you all very soon. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, come, come on, on you Spurs. Spurs.